All right. So again, I'm Eric Vickery, All-Star Dental Academy coach. And I would also say, I think my other title is friend of Dr. Gray. I think that's my other title. There you go. <laughs> that should be the most important title today. Mm -hmm. So this is our third time we've gotten together. And right now I feel like we're just having fun. So we did some insurance freedom discussion. You know, is that the right decision for me? How would I go about doing that? Do I want to evaluate being insurance free? So since our talk, has anybody made a decision that moving towards insurance freedom is the direction they want to go or have made? Has anybody done anything with that? Okay. All right. Awesome. Anything to share with the group? This is a study club. Anything to share with the group? Maybe roadblocks you ran into or how easy it's, it's, it's turning out to be? Any thoughts? Not too difficult. Just uh, started with getting rid of state insurance and met life. It's just one thing at a time, nice and slow. Nice Good. And easy. It's a marathon, not a sprint, right? Oh, yeah. All right. So awesome. Love it. When you, um, and so as you have those conversations with your patients on what you're doing, remember it's, it's, it's in person. We never send a letter. It's in person, in person, in person. And then six months from the start of those conversations, then you've got something and you got a decision to make and you decide at that point, if it's the right call. And then the eye of the storm will hit. And then you'll want to, going to want to know what to do at that point. And how do you navigate this new world of out of network with this specific insurance and with these specific patients? So. Okay, then we covered, well, anything else on insurance freedom? Questions for me about insurance freedom stuff? Can I get that recording from last time? Yes, that should be on the uh, Eric Vickery YouTube or Dr. Gray might have it. Okay. We have it somewhere. It's on his YouTube, he subscribed. Okay. Yes, yep. yeah, you can go to mine. Uh, and then, I don't know, Jen, do you wanna record this on your end today to put on your YouTube channel? I can record it, and then I'm gonna give it to someone else's hands on how to. Oh, so, I need permission from you. Yep, there you go. You've got it now. <laughs> okay. All right. So yeah. So today we will we will look at again. I'm Eric Vickery, All Star Dental Academy, friend of Dr. Gray. So we look at insurance freedom. Then last time we talked about canceling the cancellations. That's always a fun topic. And it takes six months to really see the fruit of that labor to really emphasize what you say on the front end of a, of, a, of a conversation before you ever schedule it to get the phone to stop ringing with cancellations to get people to stop uh, canceling. I am implementing a new I don't know what this, a coaching hack, I guess. And so I thought I'd share something with you guys and you guys can help me be my guinea pigs and see if it works or not. So this one might be worth remembering writing down and, and getting to your admin team. I'm trying something where I'm worried about a patient showing up. And so I only give them part of their information on their confirmation text, their reminder text, where I say, you know, Jerry, I'm so excited to see you this coming Thursday in our office. Please reply with the time you have in your calendar for your appointment with us so we can confirm where our calendars say the same things. And so their confirmation is the time of which they're going to be there. Now they physically have to go look at their calendar and then they got to come back to you and send you a text and that turn changes the color of their confirmation. So this happened because somebody who's a patient in a practice may have confirmed but not look at the exact time and then didn't show up to their own dental appointment. So uh, I'm not going to say who it was. <laughs> so the, the, the trick is this is a manual process, not an automatic process. So it's only for those of which you're concerned about. So you'd have to beat your automatic system to it. So five days in advance or something like that, get your, get your admin team to see if they can send out a, a personal text. Okay. Anything else from cancel the cancellations that you guys are trying, succeeding with, frustrated with, any cancellation concerns? Nope. Okay, man. This is the smartest group ever. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about, yeah, we already know this, right? Case presentation, <laughs> case presentation. So let's start with statistics, T KPIs of, I'll put here, statistics of case acceptance. What would you say is the KPI industry standard for dentistry when it comes to case acceptance? What are some numbers 
you adhere to or, or know when it comes to, hey, this is what your case acceptance ought to be? Hi, Jamie. 80%. 80%. I hear that. That is the number I hear. 80%. Okay. Now, 80% of what? Okay. So 80%. So you're interviewing a hygienist and or a treatment coordinator, and you got two of them, two applicants, which never happens anymore. <laughs> and by the way, little plug for All Star Dental Academy hiring services. If you need help hiring, just reach out. Robin Reese does an amazing job for hiring. So you have two applicants. And you ask this question to them, what's your case acceptance like? And one says, oh, I get 100% case acceptance. And the other says, I get 60% case acceptance. Okay, which one are you going to hire? Feels like a trick question, doesn't it? <laughs> He's going with the honest one. And I, <laughs> I, take that, I, I take you through that example because when I ask people what the KPI is for case acceptance, I hear 80%. 80% of what? 80% of what? Now we get more information. We go, okay, 100% treatment coordinator. They're presenting like two crowns a month. They're nailing them. They're slam dunks. <laughs> they're like, after they had the root canal, they're easy, easy crowns to present and get scheduled. Okay. Now the one who's getting 60%, she's presenting a hundred thousand dollars a month in treatment. Now, which one do you want? Right? We need more data to understand this KPI. So when we go through this, okay, when we go through this, we have a case acceptance tracker, of course, and we say total number of patients, total number of new patients, total dollar amount presented, how many people scheduled and for what dollar amount. And what that does for us, it gives us a few key things. Total dollars, you heard it, because you have a goal that you wanna hit of getting people healthy and dollars happens to be our metric, not that we're after dollars, it's just that's how we monitor, uh, metric and measure what we're putting out there. If it was number of procedures, we could do that too, but that could also be a, a, a lie. Oh, I did a bunch of exams last month. Awesome, you're getting people healthy. It wouldn't work, right? So dollars bigger, patients healthier. Amalgam low, on lay high, right? We just know the bigger the dollar, the healthier the patient gets. So we'd be measuring three things. The total dollars, not only that you presented, but per patient. What is your average case presented? So former treatment coordinator, the two crown a month, 100% club, not presenting that much. But the per patient would number might be $1,500. Okay, great. Now, the second number would be the number of people who schedule percentage wise. So if you uh, presented, if you presented to 100 people, our goal is 80% of the people, we want 80% of the people scheduling something. So 10 points, for the right answer on 80%, okay? So 80% of the people, now we need to dig one level deeper, the dollars. The amount of dollars we presented versus scheduled, we want a minimum of 60% of the dollars we present scheduled. So when I had Jen and Jamie and Jill and I had them track this in their practice, they're like, yeah, everybody says yes. They're in pain. <laughs> well, we have them right where we want them. If we'd all only known, right, Dr. Gray? So I think what, Jen, we looked at the tracker uh, for people scheduling. We looked at all that was like 95% across the board and everybody's getting presented the same thing, a root canal. So it was, didn't really matter. Is that about right? Felt like we had very, very few people not scheduling. It was very few people. Very, very few people because it's a different, whole different ball game. So we're gonna talk about why the difference is between endo and GP here in a second. I think some of you know. So, <clears throat> We want 80% of the people scheduling 60% of the dollars. Here's a, here's a weird, weird thing. If all of a sudden I see 95% of the dollars being accepted, what am I worried about? Not presenting enough. Not presenting, not approval addicted and not presenting enough. Back to that two crown a month club. And I go over and I look at it and sure enough, yeah, just a few people, just a couple cases, you know, either that or their whole practice is healthy. So we look at his average case size and make sure that matches. And I, for a, a veteran, you know, mature practice, uh, somebody told me the other day I was seasoned. I think that's what I was called. I'm seasoned. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's, you know, salt and pepper. I think that's what they mean by seasoned. So, um, you know, I, I like to see somewhere with at least 2,500 average a case. There's no exact science to it because I don't know how healthy your patient base is. 
But if I'm seeing 15 new patients a month presenting to them, and then I'm presenting to 60 to 70 more existing patients a month, obviously new patient case size is gonna be bigger than existing case size. So about averaging out, you know, 5,000 and 1,500, you know, we're getting into that, you know, $3,000 range, okay? There's no exact science on that metric. I just kind of have a feel for it and our coaches have a feel for it and what we're looking for. And then for anybody who doesn't schedule, we have a follow-up column and a whole system that we use for follow-ups. So I want to share that with you because for the first thing we always have to do is diagnose ourselves. Am I hitting those me me uh, metrics that Eric's talking about? Do I need help here or not? Now, some of you might not know those numbers. Okay, well, we, we've got a tracker for that, right? Well, we got you covered. So you can always do that for a few months and see how you're doing. You can also run your unscheduled appointment list. Everybody should leave with an appointment being created with the, the next phase of treatment. Even if they're not gonna schedule, it should go on wait, we'll call or unscheduled appointment list. So you could run that and see how well you're doing. Uh, Dental Intel tracks it. Uh, practice by numbers tracks it. We have a tracker that tracks it. It's very, very important KPI and oftentimes one that gets ignored because we don't want to face that music. So any questions about the KPI of that before we jump into the, that's the, the big picture, but now we're going to get in the weeds on what we say and what we do. Does that all make sense so far? Okay. Does anyone track this stuff? You guys already do this? A little bit, a little bit, not near where it's going, but a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I find it, it's a not only a, an awakening of oh, I didn't know that's where we were, up or down, but but the follow up column becomes the the real key in this. And and just real quick, I will share our. I'll just do a quick image share here so you guys can see what I'm talking about. It might help a little bit and share screen hidden hidden for example okay good so you can see new patient column how many new patients did we see it adds it up 13 how many existing patients did we present to 15 this is a, a real client okay and um <clears throat> who presented it what, what room were they in okay what sort of treatment did we present we put the dollar amount in and then what happens is all this green starts to fill out okay so we presented 28 people we presented seventy nine thousand dollars average case size of 2,800. We got 80% of the people scheduled. We got 89. And I'll make this bigger for you guys too. You guys are far back in the room. All right. Now, when you look at these numbers, what, what concerns you when you see this? Now that you've learned something from me, what's the number that concerns you out of this? 95% of the dollars got scheduled. Why is that a concern? probably playing it too safe, maybe some approval addiction, maybe we're trying to phase it out in the crown of your club, maybe we just don't have enough new patient flow large cases. And so to really go down and say, okay, who didn't schedule and why? And look at, here's an Invisalign for 6,300 didn't schedule, you know, $1,300 patient didn't schedule, 2,000 wants to call insurance to verify coverage, okay? That's a coaching topic on when a patient asks to ask for pre-authorization, what do we say in response to that? How do we follow up with that? That's a coaching topic. So you can see they did pretty good uh, getting everybody to say yes. Maybe the average case size just isn't enough. Let's see, do I have this hidden? All right, let's see what we got here. I mean, 1,487%. Now I know it's too low. I don't know if I have these hidden. Yeah, 2,066. So their average case size actually went up and they got more people to say yes. So in this scenario, that actually works for them. The problem I see is I know this doctor and I know his monthly goal is greater than $78,000. Well, how are you going to hit your monthly goal if you're only presenting $78,000? You got to get people from the past to move in or something or same day dentistry or something different. So in that scenario, it's really important to say, yeah, I want to, I want to produce 83,000 a month, just me, the doctor. Well, you didn't present enough to even get there. So what are you not presenting in the treatment plan? All right. All that makes sense, guys. All right, cool. So let's have some fun. Let's talk verbal skills. And I'm, I'm glad I got a bunch of doctors in the room here that I can pick on and, and prod and, and give you some things. So statistics. Now the what? There are two rules in sales. Now you guys know you got into sales, right? 
you decided I am wicked smart at this science thing. I'm going to get into sales and I'm going to sell teeth. You guys all knew that when you signed up to go to dental school. Um, look, most people hate the sell word in dentistry. And I think we'd all agree on that. And there is no profession that exists where sales isn't a part of it. At some point, the artist has to sell the artwork. The, the guy that raises the fish got to sell the fish. The pharmacist has got to sell the pill, right? The doctor's got to get the, the appointment book filled for the exams, okay? The dentist at some point has to sell health, okay? Well, I think what we don't like, what a better definition would be is that we don't like pressure sales. Is that fair? We don't like pressure sales. You need to do this crown now or else. That's not something that we want to be a part of. Everybody in agreement with that? Yes. Okay. No pressure sales. I am with you on that. However, we can call it whatever we want. Uh, case presentation, consultation, review of findings, whatever. It's still sales at the end of the day. And my original mentor said, if you don't like the S word sell, you can get what used to be word broke. <laughs> so I think S is a four letter word in some ways. Uh, S. Sell is a four letter word in some ways, right? It's the, it's the S word. But I, I will say... To do sales right without pressure, you can do that. You just have to make sure that you understand two key factors. Number one, people don't buy a solution to a problem they don't perceive to have. Okay, people don't buy a solution to a problem they don't perceive to have. So Jamie, I ever get a phone call on an asymptomatic patient that says, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I'm so glad you called. I was just getting ready to call you. And we talked about this two months ago. You know what? It's not bothering me anymore. I'm going to go ahead and wait. I'm going to just chew on this antibiotic for another 42 years, right? <laughs> okay. So they, they perceive there not to be a problem anymore. Why would I go spend $1,500, $2,000, $2,500 for something when it's not bothering me anymore? No pain, no problem, no pay. So is that, Jamie, you think that's fair? You hear, hear those sorts of things? Absolutely. Okay. So the most difficult patient for an endodontist is the asymptomatic patient. Okay. Now, general dentist, every single one of your patients is asymptomatic. This is why Dr. Gray's laughing at us when it comes to sales. He's not laughing. <laughs> right? Dr. Z, Dr. Z's laughing. Dr. Z's laughing. So <clears throat> Alex is calling me. Why would Alex call me right in the middle of this, Dr. Gray? I told him to. He knows better. He knows better. Okay. So... <clears throat> People don't buy a solution to a problem they don't perceive to have. So if you're going to be accused of selling something, don't be guilty of selling the crown. Be guilty of selling the fracture, the decay, the, the deep decay with a fracture, the old amalgam filling that's broken down, whatever it might be. Make sense? Okay. So n number one is you have to sell the condition. Okay. <clears throat> He's pushy. <laughs> no, not Alex. Not Alex. <laughs> He's calling me and then texting me. All right. I told him, Jerry Gray Study Club. That'll he'll, he'll leave me alone now and we'll get through this. So I want you thinking about how do I sell the condition to my patients? That's a whole process that we'll talk about. Okay. Number two, people buy for their reasons, not your reasons. Anybody grow up with parents that said something like, you need to go clean your room. And you said, why? And then they said, what? That's not so sad. Because I said so. <laughs> 10 points, 10 points. Because I said so. So, you, you know, in dentistry, we get all these initials after our name. Mine says president of coaching. You know, we got these initials. And we think, because we have these words and letters after our name, I say, you do. The problem with that is we have an underlying current, an underlying inherent problem in dentistry, okay? Young man in the red in the front. What's your name? Zach. Zach. Okay, Zach. All right. So, Dr. Zach, you're my patient. Okay. I get to play dent be the dentist here, and, and you're my patient. And I say, Zach, you pay me $250 for your first visit in our practice. Give me that money. Okay. And I'm going to tell you all of your problems. Okay. And I take your $250 and you're happy. And you say things like, this is the most thorough exam I've ever had. And I wow you and everything. And I, I take that money and I put it in my pocket. And then I look around and see if anybody's looking. And I said, hey, Zach, if you give me like $2,500 more, I'll fix those problems I found, okay? So do you see the problem we have in dentistry? Most people walk into the grocery store and they go, I need that, I need that, I need that, I need that. 
They go to the car dealership and they go, I love that car. I love that. Oh, I can't afford it. But I love that car. Nobody's pulling them in and going, hey, if you pay me money, I'll show you the cars we have to sell you. You can't look at cars for free here. You can't walk in a grocery store for free. Now, mechanics might be closest to that, but most, most patients of the mechanic self-diagnosed, their car didn't start. Not a lot of people, not a lot of professions don't have, even the physician, I have an ailment, I go. This is how cancer doesn't get diagnosed. This is how high blood pressure doesn't get diagnosed. We wait too long. Are you with me? Yes. So we have people who come in and say, I just want a cleaning. Yeah, I just want a cleaning. And we go, sure, $250 for that first visit. We'll look at everything. Oh, and by the way, do you see the problem we have? And no pay, no problem, no pay. This is why selling has such a negative connotation in dentistry. The good news is there's a solution to this. 55% of the population is pretty much going to do what you tell them to do. They're S personality types. And they just go, oh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I don't want any pain. I don't want to end up going to that Dr. Gray's office again. You know, I, I'll get it taken care of now. Sold. It's the other 45% who are skeptics, want to be in control, only care about how it looks, have something in their own, you know, hey, this is how I want to handle things. Okay. So, to reach these people, you have to understand there's two types of purchases that are being made in our lives, not just in dentistry, in our lives. Anybody ever heard of push purchase versus pull purchase? I may have talked about this a year ago at the live event, but push purchase, pull purchase. Anybody remember what that is? Okay, so a, a push purchase is synonymous with need and life thrusts this need on you. I have a toothache. I need a root canal right? My, uh, I got a flat tire. I need a new tire, right? I, I, I don't have any food in my cupboards. I need to go to the grocery store and buy groceries. Uh, my billfold, all the bills are right here. I need to pay the bills. You hear how sexy these things are? People love spending money. No, they don't love spending money here. This is life telling you what you need to do. I need to go get gas in my car. How many of you love the price of gas right now? You love doing that, right? These are things people don't love, okay? The funny thing about dentistry is we say we don't like pressure sales. This is pressure sales over here. And you know what I hear when I go observe in dental offices all the time? The quote, the, the air quotes I hear is, you need a crown. You need four quads of scaling and root planning. You need a filling. You need a cleaning. Push, 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 push. Push, purchase, push, sales. You guys hear it? Okay. Let's go to the other side, pull purchase. This is synonymous with want. Okay, now you guys finish the sentence for me. I want to go on vacation. Number one survey says every single time. <laughs> I wanna go out to eat. I wanna go on a date. I wanna go see a movie. It's usually something that we enjoy spending money on. I wanna go relax. There's no money in that. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I was walking to the airport the other day and now you have to pay to relax in these rooms at the airport. Have you guys seen those? <laughs> You can rent a, you can rent a, a uh, I don't know, eight by eight and just be left alone during your layover. So you can now pay to relax at the airport. So <clears throat> most people don't wake up in the morning and go, I, you know what I really want to do today? I think I, I want to go get a crown today. Right? Because it's not about the what, it's about the why I'd want that. Why do we want to go on vacation? Because of what it does for us the experience, the relaxation, whatever that is, the, the underlying current beneath it. What people will wake up from nightmares and go, wow, I never want to lose a tooth. That's different, but it's the same. And so you can shift your patient experience from a need push base to a want pull based experience. That fills reason number two People buy for their reasons, not your reasons. No matter how many initials you have after your name, if you're telling them what they need to do, they automatically oppose. Okay, so Dr. Gray. And who's the, who's the doctor sitting next to you right, right here in the front in blue? Or, Sorry? Marshall. All right. Dr. Gray, I want you to uh, put your hand up like this towards him. 
right? Like you're like you're like a stop sign. Okay, good. Now, Marshall, I want you to turn to him and I want you to start applying pressure to him. Start pushing on his hand. Push on his hand. Push more. What's he doing? What's Dr. Gray doing? Right back. Okay, thank you. 10 points for each of you. This is a simple human experience that never fails when we do this, right? All you were doing was applying pressure and the human nature automatically does what right back? Applies pressure back. One time I had a lady, I had told her to put her hand up and I pushed, she went. <laughs> I was like, you people walk all over you, don't they? Uh, no, no. Uh, she just didn't know what, you know, she's like, ah. So most people, you tell them you need a crown, they go, yeah, but it's not bothering me. Do I really need a crown? I don't know. It's not bothering me. And this is why cancel the cancellations. Last time we talked, you hear those things. Yeah, it's not bothering me. I'm going to wait. You know, the clinical team does the transfer of care at the front desk to the admin team. All right. They're all set. They need a crown with Dr. Zach. Have a good day. If you have any questions, let me know. And they walk away. As soon as they walk away, that team, that, that patient look, looks around like this, like, are they listening? Yeah, Jamie, you know what? It's not even bothering me. I'm not even sure why they're so worried about it. I'll give you a call. <laughs> what's the, and we'll do objections at some point in one of these meetings, but what's the number one, what survey say is the number one most common objection in dentistry? Everybody say it out loud. What is it? Money. It's a lie. Money is not the most common objection that you're believing a lie. And the reason you're believing a lie is because that's what your patients are telling you, but they're lying to you. And I know they're lying to you because I watch the cars they drive away in. I listen to their stories about their vacations. I hear them talk about their renovations of their homes. Are you with me? Right? The number one most common objection is lack of urgency or value. They have the money. They just don't believe you. Hey, Zach, you got any more money? This is why when they walk up front, your admin team hears this. Well, doctor must need to put another kid through college. I guess I need a crown. Raise your hand if your admin team's heard that one. I promise you they've heard that one. Yep. So they're not believing you because you think they're going to buy because you said so. Why do I need to clean my mouth out, doctor? Because I said so. And don't make me pull this car over and give you something to cry about. <laughs> I promise I was, I was a really good kid. I just, these are things I hear other people were told. Okay. <clears throat> so what am I saying? What am I saying? If you think about all, I'm giving you all of the typical things we hear in dental office as coaches. When we come observe, we come do practice evaluations, the, the lingo we hear, when, as I managed two practices over 10 years, I heard these things myself. And I thought there's gotta be a better way because I'm tired of getting the brunt of this. And doctor coming out going, did they schedule? And I go, no. And doctor going, what'd you do? Well, they didn't want to schedule. They didn't want to schedule. People don't buy a solution to a problem they don't perceive to have. People buy for their reasons, not your reasons. You're not doing those two things at a high enough level to get them to turn to you and go, well, what do I need to do to take care of this doctor? I'd like to get it done right away. Sometimes that happens and you hit a home run, probably 55% of the time you hit these home runs. Now, are you hitting, you know, little, little home runs just barely over the fence? Or are you hitting full mouth home runs? getting patients as healthy as possible, or are they doing two crowns a year over four years? By the time you get to that fourth year, Dr. Gray's involved, Dr. Z is involved, right? That makes sense? So the system for this, and, and, I'll, and I'll, I mean, this is a, a long topic that we're putting into an hour, but I really want you to understand why we're so passionate about this at All Star, because we're passionate about you growing to get patients healthier. You can get them healthier if you do two things. Before you ever open their mouth, you find out their reasons. If you can have a conversation with every single patient chair side before you ever open their mouth to discover their reasons why, Simon Sinek wrote a book called Start With Why. Uh, it's been around for centuries. I've been teaching it since 2001. Simon Sinek wrote that book in 2011. It's, he just did a better job than me. So it, it's, 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 it's not something new but I think it is new to us wanting to do it in dentistry. I've, I've been teaching in dentistry for a long time. And I get a lot of pushback on it because it's a conversation and most dentists, they wanna just work on the tooth. And what I say is, look, a tooth didn't walk through the door. You might be in the tooth industry, but you're in the relationship business. So you have to get in a relationship with that patient. Now, maybe it's a team member that does it for you, okay? But if, if, if I had Zach as my patient, 
I would know, he would know why I was asking these questions of him, first of all. The more information you give me, Zach, the better job we're going to do at taking care of you the way you want. We're going to be on the same page. Does that make sense, Zach? Okay. Now, hand you a mirror, and I want to talk to you about something. Tell me all the things that you're happy with, that you're satisfied with about your smile. Describe all the things that you're unhappy with, that you don't like about your smile and how it functions. And I go through these questions with them. And then I get to a place where I say, now you tell me ideally, what do you want for the health and appearance of your smile? It's not about cosmetics, not about aesthetic. It's about both. What do you want? And you start telling me all the treatment plan you want. Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's perfect the way it is. And then I ask why. That's why we call it the why. Finding the why is behind getting want dentistry. And I say, so Zach, why is it important for you to maintain this level of health for your teeth? Now, Zach, what would you say? Dr. Zach, what would you, you, I'm assuming you have a very healthy mouth. You love the way it is. You wouldn't change a thing. Why is it important for us to help you maintain that? What would you say? Uh, Longevity, quality of life. Okay. So quality of life. You ever hear the saying, people buy with emotion, justify with logic? Okay. People buy for their reasons, not your reasons. Well, that reason is an emotional reason, quality of life. So Zach, did you know somebody that didn't maintain quality of life because of their teeth? Yeah. There's an emotional tie somewhere. And because you all listen and he's not willing to share that right now. Okay. So you can dig and dig and dig and get to levels. Now, here's the funny thing. Zach's my patient. I find a fracture on number two. I don't tell Zach, okay, there's a fracture on number two, Zach. You need a crown. That's not what I say. I say, you know, Zach, I'm, I'm concerned about the fracture on this tooth that I'm showing you imagery of, right? Okay. And I know that you want quality of life. And I'm concerned about this tooth doing what's called a vertical fracture, where you lose this tooth. Concerned about the decay that would be infiltrating the tooth through that fracture and reach the nerve causing a massive toothache and causing you to have, have trouble eating on that side, affecting your quality of life. How concerned are you with saving this tooth? Okay. So do you see what I'm, what I'm doing there? I'm just taking his words and what he wants without manipulation. Okay. Because if he didn't have a cracked tooth, it would be manipulation. Without manipulation, I'm saying, hey, you want quality of life, and here's something that's going to keep you from getting that. And let me describe that to you. If I'm going to sell something, I'm going to sell the condition. Is this making sense, guys? Yes. Okay. So before you ever do a clinical exam, you do what's called an emotional exam. People buy with emotion, justify logic. People buy for their reasons, not your reasons. So that reason is emotional. And I'd have that conversation with Zach. I don't even need to do all the steps with you guys, but I'm showing you that process. Now we have a system that we coach on and we train on to get there. And Dr. Gray, Michael Simpson sent me a text message. How about that, huh? Oh, nice. Hey, look at that. (laughs) All right. So all your friends, all our friends are texting us while we're busy. Don't they know we're busy right now? All right. So... Can you, as a team, implement a system in your practice that before you ever say, okay, you've given me some money, before you give me some money for the exam today, before I sell you anything more, I truly understand what you want and why you want it. Do the emotional exam. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? We're going to set that aside for now. We're getting, getting rid of, because I said so, dentistry. We're getting rid of the word need. That is a four-letter word you do not use anymore. You, nobody needs treatment. And we're going to use what's called the 95-5 rule. Now, this is just a ratio I invented way back when, an exaggeration. It's just a made-up number, but I think it's important. 95 represents condition and consequences. Everybody look, look, you know, look at the two endodontists in the room, right? Okay. They deal with the consequences of people not dealing with the conditions. You're with me, right? Decay isn't taken care of, they end up with a toothache, they end up here, consequences. So the 95 is all condition and consequences. The 5% represents treatment. 95% of our communication is condition and consequences, and only 5% is treatment. It is not 595, okay? It is not 50-50. Here's what I hear in dental offices when I'm there. And I'm not, not, I haven't been in your dental offices. This doesn't mean you guys do this, okay? I'm sure this, you guys never say these things, okay? 
All right, so <clears throat> you look in their mouth and you hem and you ha, and you look over at your assistant and you go, MOD amalgam with defective margins with a class five on the buckle and there's frications. Uh, things got a hemi in it, so we're going to hemi section it and we're going to do a crown lengthening, a crown buildup, and a crown on that tooth. Okay, now I know none of you do this, but in that scenario, what did that patient hear? <laughs> <laughs> Bunch of mumbo jumbo, and there's one word they probably understood. Oh. Hemi. Hemi. <laughs> <laughs> the hemi. <laughs> Somebody who drives a hemi said a hemi. Yeah. Okay. So a crown, they heard the word crown, right? They heard the word crown. And now, not admin, everybody else, admin's not allowed to answer this question. When, when your patient hears the word crown, what do they think of right away? Dr. Gray, what do you think? If a patient hears the word crown, what, I, didn't, I didn't hear anything. What do they hear? They, they said uh, cost and money. Money. Okay, perfect. 10 points. Yes. I, I must have been said because it always gets said right away. So money. So all you said was want, 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 expensive, expensive, expensive. Now, what is the patient thinking about that tooth? They walked in with it. They told you they didn't have any problems. And what are they thinking right now? Spend money on something I don't have a problem with. <laughs> you see the you see the conflict and we wonder why we can't get everybody to say yes to everything when we remove that and it sounds like this now i'm talking to jamie my assistant and i say jamie for zach i'm concerned about number two it's got a large old metal filling in it an modl it's about 75 percent of two structures lost to old metal filling and it's brittle and it's actually breaking away from the tooth i'm concerned about the gap between the metal filling and the tooth in fact there's decay underneath it and i'm concerned about it burrowing down its way towards the nerve hey zach has this tooth started to hurt you yet no okay have you ever had a toothache before zach no okay have you ever heard of a root canal before zach Everybody's heard of one of those, right? Okay, yeah. So here's the deal, Zach. I'm concerned about this tooth, and I'm hoping that we've caught this in time before the decay has infected the center, the nerve of your tooth. Think of it like uh, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop, right? And sometimes that nerve is exposed and it's insulated by the old metal filling and you can't feel anything. And it's, it's an abscess and infection going to form there. I'm really concerned about that. So Jamie, foundation full coverage, okay? And so tooth number three, right? You see how I snuck it in there at the end? Now, as he heard that, think about the first example. It was want, 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 cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Now, now what did Zach hear? Turn first, condition. I did condition and I did consequences. Here's what you have. Here's where it's going. And I made it very simple wasn't complicated. I gave Jamie what she needed to chart, but I gave you what you needed to digest. And now you're marinating in it. As I go to the next tooth and the next tooth, and then I skip, everything looks good, you know, and then, oh, here, so it's just like that. And then you get the intro camera, you iTero scan it, you do all the things, and you're showing them visuals later of what you were talking about. And then I, I look at that tooth and I go, quality of life, huh, Zach? I'm concerned about quality of life when it comes to this tooth. And it just becomes interwoven. Now you can do that for eight teeth and four quads. You can do that for full mouth. You can do that for extractions and, and, and all on four. You can do it for any scenario. It depends on the patient. But I'm, I'm using a, a system, a skill called overhear psychology to get you to buy into the problem first. If you don't buy that problem, you're going to go up front and see Jen and go, yeah, he's talking about mumbo jumbo and, and it's not even bothering me and it's $1,500, I, I think I'll wait. I'll let you know when I'm ready. But what are they waiting for? In their mind, what are they waiting for? It's gonna hurt. Are we still gonna do the same treatment once it hurts? Dr. Z, Dr. Dr. Gray, raise your hands, right? All right, I hope they wait. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And maybe we don't get to in time. How many times have we opened it up and, and, and try to be Superman or Superwoman and then they're pissed because it didn't hurt before I came here because I didn't prep them the way I just prepped them and said, I hope we're catching this in time. 
Did you catch that little tidbit there? Okay, and then we start getting, there's no bite, there's no bite, there's no bite, just, okay, it's not touching anything, maybe it won't hurt anymore. That's not what it was, it was already, it was already infected. Yeah, Jamie, uh, we need you, we need you, Dr. Gray, to get on the phone. Okay, so <laughs> our goal, obviously, Dr. Gray, plug your ears, our goal, obviously, is for our patient never to have to have a root canal. And we use that as an implication, a consequence of what's coming, but they're not always going to be able to do that. Okay, Dr. Ray, you can unplug your ears. So, <laughs> so our goal is our goal is prevention there, and we use the toothache and extraction, the cons toothache and root canal as a consequence to getting it done now without intimidation, without scare tactics, just helping them understand what's coming. Okay. Now, I won't go through into all everything today just because of I talk too much sometimes, all the time. So having heard what I've said so far, understanding the diagnosis, the, the, the KPIs of all of this, getting people that we want to do more dentistry per visit, right? By the way, your KPI, bam, your minimum that you need to have on doctor side, 500 per patient, 500 per hour. That's the KPI. I think we're doing KPIs in January. Yeah, we'll do KPIs in January. So if you're not doctors, just your chair, 500 per patient, 500 per hour minimum, then we're not getting the case acceptance we want or we're not ideal day scheduling it, one or the other, okay? So something to diagnose and look at. But if you understand, okay, this is where I'm going with patients, average case size, the dollar amount, 80% of what I present, I need to present this much to get here, okay? Now it's, am I effective in my conversation to get them to want to do this? So that it sounds like this in the end, other side of the exam now. So Zach, I know earlier you told me it was really important for you to have just a, a, a quality of life, that your smile was, we maintain it, we keep it healthy, and that you maintain a quality of life to, to function uh, for the rest of your life. Taking that into consideration during the exam, I'm concerned about the things we talked about during the exam, the infection in your gums, not feeling it, right? It's like that high blood pressure, not feeling it. We're trying to catch it before the heart attack. Also, the, the teeth that have the old metal fillings in it that are fractured and have decay that we're trying to get to before they turn into the volcano erupts and turns into a toothache requiring a root canal, okay? My question for you, Zach, is how concerned are you with both of those things in these areas of your mouth? Okay. Notice he couldn't say yes or no. What did he say? Sorry. He gave me a, a complete answer, not just a yes or no, right? I'm very concerned. I'm not concerned, whatever it is. Now, if he says, yeah, I'm, I'm not really concerned. It's not bothering me. Okay, great. Well, let's talk about four quads of scaling the root planning and some crowns then. It wouldn't make sense for me to do that. That's mm -hmm. why this is so key, so important that you lay it out and you say, how? Not are you, how? How concerned are you with this, Zach? Oh, I'm very concerned. That is not somebody who's lying to me. That is not somebody who goes, yeah, oh yeah, totally. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah, 6,000, sure, sounds good. I'll write you a check, take checks? Yeah, okay, I'll be here, yeah. Are they coming? The yes sir, we call those the yes sirs. So get away from asking yes or no questions. How? How, how much sense does it make for us to address these concerns? Oh my gosh, totally, yeah. Or completely no. Well, I'm not really sure. It's not bothering me. Re-engage in conversation. Most dentists avoid this question out of just fear of frustration. They don't want to hear the no here. They'd rather tell people what needs to be done, go up front and see if you can afford it. You get it? You face the music here to see if you did a good enough job. You're really saying, did I sell the condition? It's actually called test the buy-in. Did they, I haven't told, talked about treatment yet. I haven't got to the 5%. So did they buy into the problem? Because if they don't buy in the problem, they ain't buying your solution. Oof, ain't, that's rough, huh? <laughs> Thought I was in the South for a second, maybe, maybe that's not what it was. So you gotta check the buy-in. You gotta see if they're really in. How concerned are you with this? They say, very. 
Great. Well, then wouldn't it make sense for us to talk about a plan on how we can take care of this? Sure. They just told me now two times they believe they have a problem. They want a solution. Wow, doc, I didn't realize it was that bad. What do I got to do to fix it? Remember those? That's all I just did. Now you're 5%, you get to talk about treatment, you get to talk about crowns and bridges and implants and root canals and scalings and planings and, and hemis sections and, the, and all, all the things you love to talk about, but you only get 5%. That's it. You can sell a case in one minute and unsell it in three. So don't, don't overdo it. Okay, like I did. Okay. Now, key point here, one more confirmation. So I describe all the treatment to Zach, quadrant scaling, periodontal therapy, uh, restorations, saving his teeth, make him look beautiful. And I say, Zach, how do you feel about moving forward with this plan? Ready to go. Okay. Notice he couldn't say yes. Did you hear it again? Versus if I say, Zach, is this something you want to do? No. <laughs> I gave him a yes or a no option. He could even say yes like this. Yeah? You can say yes, but mean no, right? It's really hard to lie with more than one word. Okay. So now let's say you're not in, Zach. Let's say you don't want to do it. Okay. So Zach, uh, how do you feel about moving forward with this plan? Not ready to. Okay. You see how he can't even just say no? I'm forcing him to give me more information. How is your word? If I could give you one thing to take away from tonight, how? Jamie, how good is this evening going? Jamie, how can I support you in your growth as an individual? Jennifer, how can I get you and Jamie to, to get along better? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Do you hear how even leadership stuff is better with how? We teach our leadership seminar intensive, our leadership uh, intensive for doctors, spouses, office managers, team leads. And one of the things we talk about is how. How you get your team to do what you want them to do. You do that through accountability questions. How? You do that through implication questions. How are we going to make sure X doesn't happen? How are we going to make sure it doesn't turn into a toothache? Um, you, you can get away with some do you knows, right? Do you know anybody uh, or who? Who do you know who's, who's had a toothache before? More than one word answers, right? But if I say, do you know? Yeah, that doesn't help me. I did that earlier with Zach. And I said, do you know anybody who didn't have quality off? Eh, yeah, didn't really give me much, right? And I played it off like, oh, well, he doesn't want to tell everybody. No, I asked the question wrong, but you guys weren't ready for that yet. <laughs> All right. Have you ever heard a patient say, I just don't want to lose a tooth? Your follow-up question to that is what? Why? Why is it important for you to not lose any teeth? Oh, my grandfather lost his teeth. And, and when I was a kid, he would stick his tongue up in there and go, gah, 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 at me as a little kid. And I was terrified. God's honest truth. So everybody has a why if they say something they want or don't want. I want a, I want a, 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 I want a fast Cadillac that can smoke a, a, a Hemi uh, and, and a race, okay? Why? Well, because I want to make Jamie feel bad about the kind of car she has. No, I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> there's always going to be a reason underneath <laughs> what that is, right? There's always going to be an underlying current to that, always. Even the husband who comes in and says, I just want to get my teeth cleaned. My wife's making me come in. You guys have one of those? Why? Make the wife happy. My guess is she's smelling something that she doesn't like anymore is telling you to come get your teeth cleaned. <laughs> Have you been sleeping on the couch? No, don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. Don't say that. Okay. Let's, let's leave some time for some questions, okay? Because I'm giving you a lot of information. I probably covered three hours of information in our one-day event here, one day teaching and three hours of coaching in, in 52 minutes. So um, you're drinking from a fire hydrant right now, but I want to create a lot of value for you. I want to see opportunity and, and I want to support you in this. So there should be something I didn't make clear. That should be totally normal. And I'm totally fine hearing that. So 
what didn't I make clear? What did, how did I create some confusion here? I must be amazing. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, I will say this. I've taught this for 22 years and this is the best I've ever taught it. 100% the best I've ever taught it. I'm not even lying. I'm not trying to brag about myself. Why, why do you think this is the best I ever taught it? Because every single time I teach it, I'm getting better at teaching it, right? Yeah. Okay. So repetition creates mastery, even from a coach who wrote these things, who, who researched these things to create it, who learned from their mentors to, to put it all together. So I, I want to challenge you guys, but I also don't want to overwhelm you. Okay, so let me give you some action items. Knowledge is powerless without action. So let me give you some action items. Do me a favor, use the word how. Use the word how with your patients. When you're trying to get, see if they're committed to it, see if you can use the word how. When you're trying to get your team to get on board with you on some things, use the word how, okay? Number two, focus on selling the condition with your patients during that new patient exam. Use real basic word, verbiage, communication, simple talk. Don't dumb it down, but use real simple talk. Describe it vividly like I was doing, the conditions, what you're seeing. Paint them a picture with your words. Show them the picture afterwards. Dr. Gray. Hey, Dr. No, yep. not, not that Dr. Gray. Oh. Hey, Dr. Gray, <laughs> is this resonating with you at all? Like you're, 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 you're our resident, just such a fresh set of eyes that, that when you're looking at these patients and you're seeing what's going on with them, are you seeing that there, there's a way to communicate to them where they're getting it or not getting it? Yeah, I, I think so. I feel like some of my feedback that I get is they tell me that I talk too much as is. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, uh, so personally, I'm trying to like talk more succinctly in, in my exams. I also feel like they press me for time a lot. So you're trying to say it fast. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. So by simplifying the talk, you can say less, right? You got a worm in the apple. You ever seen one of those? You got a worm in the apple that decays is eating the inside of the apple, right? And what we're trying to do is prevent that worm from getting to that core of the apple to eat it. That's all I'm worried about. And it may already be there. I don't know. It's really hard to tell on a, on a, just a slide of an image. It's not even 3d. It's not even 2d. Okay. Uh, we, I have something for you guys that one of our mastermind members put out and he's got this, these two devices along with his intro camera where he lights up the tooth and then does something to it. And it just shows like a spider web of fractures inside the tooth. Have you guys seen this, this process? Uh, I, I need, do we have, uh, Jen, do we have an email group for this? Yes, we have email addresses. Okay. Send everybody an email with me. And then I'm going to send back out. I, I just learned this like last week. I couldn't believe it. This is amazing. You know, we're concerned about, okay. I see a, I see a external fracture. And then you, you start prepping and you start following that fracture, all these different, where you're going, this is like a spider web in here. This, it, it is crazy. It, it, and it's not expensive at all. It was like $8. Just the way he's, he's Jimmy rigged this process of showing the patient on the screen now with the intro camera, what's going on inside the tooth. It's like a light behind it and something else he puts on it. And then the assistant takes the picture. It's crazy. I don't even understand it. I'm going to send it to you guys though. And you're going to be able to describe what's going on underneath that amalgam filling. Okay. I have one okay. thing sure, yeah. that we you talked about before that I think is kind of important is minimizing the condition using like the word little or, you know, we're just watching this or we're, you know, using those words, minimizing what you're recommending. Yeah. Yeah. You have a little cavity here and it's only going to cost you $350. <laughs> right. Oh, there's a little abscess on the apex here. And for $2,000, we'll take care of that for you. 
Right? It's not bothering them, right? So anything you say that detracts from the severity of the condition, if we're going to sell the condition, that's a big no-no. Tiny this, little that, small that. I always joke and say, if you can't use the word pregnancy at the end, you know, a little bit of pregnancy going on here, then you know it's a, a minimizing term. That's not doing you any favors. So yeah, there's some hidden things in what I was teaching. When I was saying, there's hours and hours and hours of teaching. What Jen picked up on was, I was also eliminating limiting terms. I was killing killer words is what that is. And I'm stopping the bad lingo from causing me a, to create cancellations, not getting case acceptance, whatever it might be. Yeah, it's not bothering me because I said it was a little tiny thing. It was an MODL amalgam with defective margins. Let's put a crown on it. And we wonder why when I say, all right, Zach, they're going, yeah, why would I give you more money? It's not bothering me. I walked in with this. I haven't seen a dentist in two years. I think I'm good. They say two years, but we know it's been four. Okay, what else? Cameron, that was great. What else? You know, how about the patient who doesn't refute at all your findings? You mm -hmm. show them control photos, the, the, the bite wings, and they can see the caries. And uh, Dr. Gray just saw a patient of mine who I started working with two years ago and went from needing three endos two years ago to now five. And uh, he is so fearful to do any dentistry that it's, it, it, the fear has immobilized him. And I yeah. had another one earlier this week yeah. as well. So just, let's start with that one, Zach. So Zach, mm -hmm. is it that he doesn't believe there's a problem? No, he knows there's a problem. There you go. It's that there's another barrier. Okay, so money, time, fear, urgency, trust. So the fear is getting in the way of him doing that. You need to handle that objection. So March, Dr. Gray, we'll handle objections, okay? Because we'll do KPI January, March, we'll do objections. Okay. So when you get that objection of fear, you have to address that. Okay, you're here now, Ricky Bobby. How can we best take care of you so that you want to come back for these things? Now you got to have anxiolysis. You got to have sedation. You got to have nitrous. You got to have something, Valium. You know, something that gets them comfortable doing one, one small thing. Wow, that was not bad. Now let's go to more. And then you got to have financial arrangements to match that. Stop telling me. You're, people are like, I don't want to pay interest on my loan for dentistry. Okay, we, again, sorry, Dr. Gray. You're gonna, you're gonna pay for $1,500, $2,000 root canals you know, over the years. That's more expensive than the interest to get it done now. Dr. Gray is gonna kill me later. <laughs> all right, all right. So I could talk for two days on this. It's what I do. And <laughs> this is a big topic. I'm very passionate about it. And I, I want you guys to know that, that this team will support you in what I teach. If you have questions, ask them. They are experts, okay? They're, they, they can handle questions. And if for some reason they can't, for whatever reason, I'm here. Our coaching team's here for you to help these things. We do two-day full events on all of this. We do coaching for this. We have online training for this. Um, our, our podcast is free. It has all of this kind of stuff on it. Everything's out there for you. So talk about it as a team. Do some masterminding right now amongst yourselves. What do you run into in your practice and how have you solved it? I think that would be good time spent as well. And then when I see you guys in January, happy Thanksgiving, happy holidays, Merry Christmas. When I see you guys in January, let's come back to this and say, all right, how are we doing with some of the things you wanted us to try? How questions, right? Sell that condition. If you can get to a third, if you can get to a place where you're doing that emotional exam and having that conversation with patients, that would be amazing. Okay, that'd be, that'd be pretty impressive. That's a, that's a tough verbal skill. Not something that Dr. Gray has to worry about too much because he's focusing on selling the condition and the consequence is already here. Now it's just a conversation about moving forward treatment. It's much, much easier when the patient's already been referred by you and they're in pain and it's a second opinion and on and on and on. Now it's just, can we make it affordable? Not to oversimplify your job, Jen and Jamie. <laughs> Jill, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> hey, it's, a lot harder than that. it's not that hard. It's not that hard. Okay. No, it is. It is. Cause it's an expense, right? They're, they're afraid. There's an expense. There's things you got to do to win them over. They got to see you as credible and have confidence in you as well. So many things here to talk about. So give some of these things a try. Don't be afraid. Your patient's not going to go, Hey, you forgot to um, eliminate the limiting term there. Can you do that again? They're not going to know. So just, just try these things, test them out, see what kind of results you get from them. And I would love the feedback. Jen, get me in an email loop and I'll get them the information I just got today on this really, really cool device. 
uh, that just, it just shows the inside of the tooth. It's amazing. Okay. Anything else for me before we wrap up? All right. It's great seeing you guys. Thank you so right. much. You. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful evening. Drive safe. All right. Take care. Bye guys. Bye. -bye.